Okay, so as the second part of our focus on guns and violence, um, we are just going to look at the 2019 Christchurch um, mass murder. And it's interesting, what we, we can call it a whole lot of things. We can call it a massacre, we can call it a murder, we can call it a terrorist attack. And each of these phrases emphasizes a different part of it. Um, and, and, and it's interesting to, to look at what the words, what, what does the word massacre mean in people's minds? When one classifies it as a terrorist attack, what does that mean? Um, um, and, and think about the, the way in which those classifications actually shape how things are thought about and how they are reacted to. Um, but I'm sure you're all aware of what happened on the 15th of March, 2019, in the city of Christchurch in New Zealand, a um, gunman, an Australian, a 28 year old man from New South Wales, entered two different places of worship with, um, a, with carrying, carrying more than one automatic assault rifle and opened fire on the worshippers, killing um, 49 people and injuring 51. So this is a, a firstly, an incredibly large scale mass murder, um, a major act of, 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 of terrorism in a country that is not characterized by violence. Um, typically, New Zealand has low levels of violence, um, not much gun crime, very few homicides. Um, by global standards. Um, and so this was a, a real turning point, but, but something else about, ab about this, this terror attack, um, th that it was designed to attack people at their most vulnerable. It was designed to attack them when they, were, when they were at worship, when they were at prayer. And it was specifically targeted against a specific group of people based on their religion. It was a, first of all, it was a hate crime was a hate crime that was directed by a person from a certain category, a um, essentially a white male uh, with strong ideological support for a racist colonial um, uh, worldview against a, a, a minority community, um, the New Zealand Muslim community, specifically targeting them with these extremely destructive weapons at the time that they were most vulnerable. And all of those are really significant elements in this. And for some of you, perhaps um, this focus may be very unsettling, very confronting, and it isn't necessary for you to um, proceed with it if you find it very disturbing, but we are going to, we're not going to spend our time looking at the gory details. And um, we're gonna try and, understand what can be done about this kind of problem. Okay. And one of the, the, the things he did, one of the extraordinary things that he did is he live streamed the murders. That he, he, he started a live stream um, that was on the internet live during, while this was happening, and subsequently circulated in various kind of underground parts of the internet. Um, he had the camera of him driving to the various locations, music playing, um, going in, and you actually see the images of this violence. And that's, that's a particularly kind of ex um, extraordinary example of, of the way in which the media intersects with, with violence and the way in which one of that there seems to be this inextricable link between violence and a kind of media spectacle. And in this case, the mass murderer actually wanted the world to see this, the, these murders. He wanted, he wanted the world to, to witness this hate crime. Um, and, it, and it does sort of create the risk that of, of, of this becoming a kind of new norm, that people will actually um, D deliberately engage in acts of violence, not simply to become celebrities, which is a kind of a, an old story that of kind of serial killers and mass murderers wanting their moment of fame, but that they can actually create their moment of fame um, by, by creating live visual records of, of their acts of violence. Now, how do we think about this guy, this 28 year old from New South Wales, who went to a foreign country, bought weapons, 
and decided to commit this devastating act of violence against a vulnerable community. Um, and one of the things that becomes clear is as we understand him, and we do understand him for one reason, is that he wrote a manifesto. This was not like a sort of impulsive act. This was an act that he had planned for a very long time in great detail. And he wrote a manifesto, which he published on the internet, um, called The Great Replacement, where he explains over about 37 pages, I think it is, exactly what his motivation and reasoning are. And it's an interesting document of getting inside the mind of a person who is driven to an extreme act of destructive violence. Um, and when we look at it, what's interesting is it becomes clear that the Christchurch murderer is someone who listened to particular accounts of violence. He listened to, he was influenced by certain under, ways of explaining the world. Um, and they were kind of marginal ways of explaining the world, but they're ones that have become quite powerful in certain circles. Um, and this really draws us to the attention that, that the way in which we understand things, the way in which we understand people, society, um, actually really influences the question of of who of, of the violence that happens and doesn't happen. It's, and, and, and we try to map this at the beginning of the course. That pe people have theories of violence, but they also have theories of the world that they're not aware of. They think the world works in certain ways, and they may be right and they may be wrong. But if they think it works in a certain way, that motivates them to do certain things. If they think they're at risk in certain ways, they will try and defend themselves in certain ways. You know, in the U.S., if people think that, 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 that violent criminals are everywhere in society and that owning a gun will make you safe in your home, then they will buy a gun. And when someone opens a window in the middle of the night, they will shoot them. And that person may be a, a burglar and that person may be their daughter coming home from a party that she wasn't supposed to go to. People do stuff based on understandings. Okay, and, and violence is related to understandings of the world. The problem is that those understandings of the world may be wildly distorted, totally factually inaccurate. And that what seems to be failing is the system of verifying, the system of checking whether what people believe is even in any way related to reality. Okay, and so this is one of the reasons why we need to think about how we talk about violence. Because the way in which we talk about it either increases or decreases violence, and it either helps or harms the victims. So we need to be we need to be really mindful of our words, our concepts, and above all of our of our hidden theories, uh, the unconscious theories of violence we have, and how those impact on the world. Okay, now when we look at this murderer. There's two kind of big competing narratives uh, about him. There are two ways of explaining him. The one is um, the lone wolf story, and this is this is a typical mass murder story. Okay, and and it's and and out of televisual stuff, Netflix, the the this this kind of narrative, especially around the serial killer, the lone wolf, the the isolated individual who's acting out of disturbed personal psychological motives, maybe even mental illness. Um, and this is this is a kind of a this is a narrat explanatory narrative. This is one of the the sort of everyday theories. Um, so here we have a an emotionally disturbed, um, isolated individual, sort of broken his links with normal everyday society, uh, festering in his basement, ideas influenced by crazy extremist. Um, things on the internet, maybe an unhappy childhood. It can, you, you can assemble it in any number of ways. But, but the interesting thing about that story, it's a story about an individual, about an, an, an individual who is different from everyone else. And pre it's precisely their difference that makes them dangerous, that they're not like us, they're not like us normal people. And so they are weird and dangerous and it's the weirdness um, that we need to worry about because we aren't dangerous in that way. And, that's, and it creates an us and them between kind of normal people and crazy violent people. The another way of looking at it is that in fact, he's an individual who is expressing a long-standing and in certain circles socially accepted 
set of ideas about society that is embedded in certain relationships that are supported by the, by the people around him, that he, he, he is educated by sources of information that explain the world to him in a certain way, um, and that he's an almost inevitable product of those social forces. Now, this kind of disturbed lone wolf story and the other story that perhaps he is a manifestation of, of, of something that is systematically wrong in society, these lead to totally different kinds of interventions and totally different kinds of preventative strategies. Okay, so let's look at this murderer. Let's look at his motives and his opportunity. Firstly, opportunity. Why did he go to New Zealand um, to kill people? Why didn't he kill them in Australia? There are, there are plenty of vulnerable immigrant uh, groups. There are plenty of minority religious groups. Um, why did, he, why did he go to New Zealand? Well, as we explained before, quite simply, because Australia has fairly rational gun laws and you can't walk into a shop and buy a military-style automatic assault weapon that you can use for killing 50 people in a couple of minutes. You could in New Zealand in March of 2019. You can no longer. And this, once again, New Zealand immediately after the event changed the legislation in a way that they've utterly failed to do in the United States. So, but, but it's interesting that as in Australia, it took the Port Arthur massacre. In New Zealand, it took the Christchurch massacre to, to, to listen to the scientists. Like they were, this was always known, it was always known that if you don't have this regulation, people will get killed. But the politicians ignored it, the public ignored it. Then you suddenly have a, a huge media event, massacre, and people are like, oh my God, we better, we better do the right thing. What's going on there? Why can't people just take rational advice when they're not freaking out? Why does there have to be a crisis? Why do, why do people have to be murdered in, in large numbers for, for politicians to listen to, to the, the people who actually have understood this stuff? Um, it's a really interesting question to think about. Okay, so opportunity. He could get the weapons in New Zealand, so he did it in New Zealand. That's why I didn't do it here. Um, and once again, if they'd had the legislation they have now, at the beginning of March 2019, this guy, he wouldn't have done it. He certainly would have, wouldn't have done it there. Maybe he would have had to go to another place to do it. Maybe he would have had to go to the United States to do it. But that speaks to opportunity. But what about motive? And this is an interesting case because we know a lot about his motives because he wrote them down. He wrote this manifesto. Um, and he kind of didn't write it. Actually, it, like if, if this was handed in as a first year essay, it would be sent for disciplinary action for plagiarism. He plagiarized his manifesto from, another, uh, from various other sources, including another manifesto written by another mass murderer, a Norwegian mass murderer, who killed a whole lot of children at a, at a summer camp in Norway. The, 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 worst, the worst event of violence in Norwegian history since the Second World War. A, a terrible, terrible incident, e e even um, more serious than the Christchurch killings. Um, but he had ideas in his head, and he wanted people to know these ideas, and he believed that his ideas were important. He believed his ideas were right. He believed they were important. He believed they were important enough to kill many people for, and he believed, that, and he didn't try and get away with it. He didn't try and, like, hide this. He told people he was going to do it. He did it. He published it on the internet. He live streamed the murders. He, he, he posted the manifesto online. And what's interesting is in his own account, he believed he was going to be a hero. He actually says this. He thinks he's going to be remembered as a hero of the early 21st century in the way that figures like Nelson Mandela um, are remembered as, as liberation heroes for their people. He believed that, he, he actually said he thought he would get a Nobel Peace Prize eventually for, for, for the fact that he had, he had done something so good with these murders that he would be looked back on history, by, uh, looked back um, historically as, as a hero. So he really believed in what he was doing. And it's precisely his belief that made him dangerous. Without those beliefs, he would have just, you know, been a guy going to work, going fishing, doing whatever he wanted to do. 
but, but he had a set of ideas that made him do certain things, um, and those things are very destructive. So what we need to say is, how did he come to believe these ideas? Firstly, where did, where did they come from? Where, where did he get the ideas? Um, both in the sense of how did he get exposed to them in, in his own experience, like, like literally on what day did, did he do what thing? Did he turn on the TV? Did he talk to a friend at a barbecue? Uh, was he lurking on 8chan? Where did the ideas come from? But also, not just how was, it, well, how was he exposed to them, but what is the history of those ideas? Where did those ideas kind of culturally come from over the last decades or hundreds of years? How did those become ideas that existed and were accepted in certain social groups, okay? And it becomes really clear where his ideas come from. He comes out of a long history of white supremacist racists, um, and very specifically, a particular uh, kind of white supremacist discourse, which is the white genocide discourse, which dates back um, to the early 20th century um, and was really important with the rise of the Nazis in Germany and the, and, and the Second World War, okay? This idea that, that, that the, the, the white races, and it's interesting because what we call whiteness now was then highly differentiated. European people were not all considered uniformly white. There were a number of different categories of whiteness. And the kind of top of the white pyramid was the Teutonic, the Germanic, um, version of whiteness, like the Mediterranean whiteness was not so good. Um, you know, there was like within these European whitenesses, there were hier racial hierarchies even. Um, and, but, but uh, underpinning this belief is this idea of that, 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 that white people, the descendants of Europeans are a kind of master race they the best people in the world, that civilization depends on them, and that they're under threat. And this is what's so interesting, this sense that like this, 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 this supremacist whiteness is, is under a terrible, terrible threat at the moment. And this constructs a, an, a profoundly paranoid worldview. Um, and paranoia and violence are very closely linked. When people believe they are under threat, they retaliate. They don't think they're committing acts of aggressive violence, they think they're committing acts of defensive violence. So, so from their standpoint, they think they're acting in self-defense, but they're not. They're acting um, out of a paranoid interpretation of reality. Um, and, and paranoia makes people very dangerous. Um, okay, not only that, there was another, there was another discourse that wrote, risen up in the last 20 years, and this is specifically after the 9-11 attacks on the United States, the, the, the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers, which is the rise of Islamophobia, a kind of an anti-Muslim discourse that was mobilized by the American kind of um, right-wing politicians and, and the military to justify their invasion of uh, countries that are extremely wealthy in oil, to justify um, going in, overthrowing those countries' governments, occupying those governments, and claiming access to those natural resources. And this has really became the kind of global co conflict of the early 20th century. And Australia joined in, as they always do with the United States, in these war crimes. Um, in the invasion of Afghanistan, in the invasion um, of Iraq. Um, and, and many young Australians um, have, have actually um, been, ha been harmed by that. They've, you know, they've experienced sort of traumatic events, in, but have also committed war crimes in those countries. Um, um, so this is something that, is, that has affected um, people across the kind of Western societies. Um, but, but it became part of a huge discourse, this kind of a, and, and, and there was this idea of a clash of civilizations, that, that Christianity and Islam were eternally at war since the Crusades, um, and that there's a kind of a fight to the death and a total cultural incompatibility, despite the fact that both of these religions come from exactly the same historical roots. They, they come from the same kind of, uh, you know, um, Middle Eastern mythologies, um, Judaism, um, coalescing them and splitting into Christianity, splitting into um, Islam. Um, they're essentially the, the, the same historical culture. 
um, but, but articulated as being in some kind of weird cultural fight to the death. Um, and the media then was involved in, in sort of perpetuating this idea of terrorism. The idea that the reason why the West had to violate human rights, the reason why the United States went completely in the face of all the kind of international conventions that had been established after the Second World War, um, unilaterally committing war crimes, um, legalizing the use of torture against people who, um, uh, well, I mean, torture at all. Like, I mean, there's a blanket, you know, like, you know, sort of universal um, kind of human rights issue about torture, but, 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 but against people who they had almost sort of no evidence to believe could even provide them with useful information. Um, so this, so these, these kind of the military, military attacks, overthrow the governments, occupations, torture, um, all of these things became justified under this, the construction of fear, the construction of a paranoia in Western societies, that Western societies were under threat from Islamic terrorism. And not only threat from Islamic terrorism, but threat from Islam itself. And that's the interesting thing, that, that from a, a tiny fringe group of militant radicals, uh, one of the world religions of over a billion people suddenly starts being perceived by certain people as, as threatening. Uh, and all of this is essential to understanding how this murderer develops his kind of paranoid worldview. Um, and, um, and we can go into a lot of specifics. So when, and, and he articulates his political worldview. Firstly, he calls himself an ethno-nationalist, essentially an ethnic nationalist. He believes in the nation state. He believes in patriotism towards your, the nation of your birth. Um, but ethno, he also, he's also a racist. He believes in, 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 in ethnic difference and ethnic supremacy. And he also describes himself as an eco-fascist. Now, it's interesting the term eco-fascist because e ecological thinking is typically associated with kind of left-wing, more kind of socially responsible thing. It's thinking it, we, we, we don't often think of like the Green Party and fascism together or the climate change um, activism and fascism together. Um, but in fact, historically, they're related. In fact, the Nazis were very, very into nature they were very into part of their like the national their their, their their german national supremacism was about the land of germany about the the, the forests and mountains of germany and so this kind of inch, this, this this kind of concern with the natural environment has historically been linked to to fascist nationalism um and particularly um this murderer followed uh, the british fascists it was a kind of historical movement a lot of people in britain actually didn't want britain to go against germany they wanted britain to support hitler and the nazis and they supported fascism um so he followed a particular kind of british um, fascist um ideologue called Os uh, oswald mosley he also expressed admiration of the chinese state um of and of the authoritarianism of the chinese state and part of that is that he's explicitly anti-democracy, that he believes in authoritarian government, he believes in state control. Um, and linked to that, um, you know, his anti-diversity, pro-ethnic um, uh, and national separation. Interestingly, there's another kind of weird spin in this, is that he's a kind of anti-capitalist. And once again, normally one thinks that's a kind of a, 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 a kind of a, you know, left-wing view, um, not a, not a right-wing fascist view. Um, he's against globalization. He's against the way labor has um, been outsourced from Western societies leading to kind of deindustrialization and increasing um, poverty uh, in Western societies. Um, he's, he's, he, he's against kind of rampant consumerism. He's against the destruction of the natural environment. But also he's a strong traditionalist. He believes in traditional values, the nation, the family, um, ethnic. Um, he believes in ethnic separation. Um, and he's against kind of the, the world of, of the, the social change, the world of migration, the world of internationalism, cosmopolitanism, people meeting together, um, cultures influencing each other. He's, he's strongly opposed to all of those, those sorts of things. He articulates this very clearly. Um, and what's interesting about all of that is essentially 
it comes to the idea that as a white man, he feels endangered. He feels like he's under threat. He feels like his culture is under threat. His white supremacist uh, culture is under threat. Um, and so I'm going to read you some quotes from this kind of deranged manifesto. Um, and he says, it's the birth rates. It's the birth rates. It's the birth rates. If there's one thing I want you to remember in these writings, it's that the birth rates must change. Even if we were to deport, deport all non-Europeans from our lands tomorrow, the European people would still be spiraling into decay and eventual death. Despite the effect of sub-replacement fertility, the population figures show that the the population does not decrease in line with the sub-replacement fertility levels. What sub-replacement fertility means is that essentially in most Western societies, um, people are having less children to the point that the population is shrinking rather than growing. And particularly white people are having less children. So, so they're becoming a smaller proportion of the population. This is what he means by sub-replacement fertility. Um, uh, and, but he's saying that although although sort of the reproduction rates in in white communities is 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 causing those populations to grow, then the the population in those countries is rising, and it's because of migration. And of course, Australia is a classic example of this. Pop, uh, one third of population growth is because of people having kids, and two thirds of it is because of migration. Okay. And here's his issue with that. He's saying that they, they, they're, they're, being, they're coming to be in, in, in not only in Western societies, but in the societies that have, been, that, that have been colonized by Europeans. They are getting to be less and less white people. And for him, this is not the world transforming into diversity and becoming more interesting and, 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 and more international. It's a massive threat to, to his sense of self. And so he says, this is ethnic replacement. This is cultural replacement. This is racial replacement. This is white genocide. This is, this is really interesting, this notion of white genocide, incredibly interesting notion. Because genocide, we normally think of the Nazis, right? We think, I mean, there've been other, the Rwandan genocide, the Armenian genocide, a sort of military attack on a group of very vulnerable people. Um, but this is genocide simply by migration and, and reproduction. There's no military attack in this genocide. Um, so where, how does he arrive at this notion of white genocide, this, this sort of paranoid sense that the world is, is, um, is so dangerous to him and to, um, and to the people that he... Um, um, the people that he represents, okay? Um, so, um, this idea actually has a history. It has a hundred year history. And it starts, uh, it's built on kind of 19th century race theory and eugenics that came out of Europe. And that's idea that there's a hierarchy of races and that white Europeans at the top and black Africans are at the bottom and other people are somewhere in the middle. Okay, this, so the, the ideology that we used to to justify slavery and colonization, and it sort of and it and it re, and it was expressed in the in the, in the United States um, in the early twentieth century. Nineteen twelve, Madison Grant wrote a book called *The Passing of the Great Race*, and this was a book that actually influenced Hitler. Interesting that Hitler's kind of racist ideas actually came from the United States, from people who were defending white supremacy against. Um, anti-slavery, you know, they were, they were group, they were kind of, they were upset about the fact that they couldn't be a slave owning race anymore. Um, and, 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 and so the, 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 the set of ideas of that, 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 that white, white, white culture is under threat comes from Madison Grant goes to Hitler. Um, and that kind of has, gets discredited after the second world war, when people actually see what the world looks like, if you believe these things. But it comes back in the 1990s with uh, these white nationalists, David Lane and Richard Sp Spencer, um, and, a, and an online white supremacist movement suddenly comes into existence um, and, um, and, and becomes quite powerful on certain sectors of the internet. Uh, then in, into the 21st century, we, the, the book, um, 
uh, also called the great, the great Replacement, and a video by this kind of weird sort of online pseudo journalist Lawrence South called the, the Great Replacement. And all of these, all of these are, are sort of pushing this idea that kind of white culture, and, and it's interesting because in the supremacist idea of white culture and kind of civilization, the very notion of civilization is European and white, is under threat. It's under threat from migration, it's, it's under threat from population changes. Um, and, and, and so this becomes a powerful, this kind of the sense of paranoia, the sense of like we, we're losing our world, uh, starts making people kind of feel desperate and crazy. And they don't recognize that what's changing in their world is kind of is is kind of economic things that it's you know it's actually about kind of neoliberalism globalization declining sort of um, industrial infrastructure of western societies um the the in, the increase in kind of global movements they don't see it as that they see it as a kind of attack on on this on their particular culture and they can't imagine themselves as being human as being human beings on earth other than being like that culture other than like their whiteness and their masculinity and that's what's interesting is that the total kind of inflexibility the total ability inability to to kind of to 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 engage with anything that isn't already what you know and what you think you are kind of intolerance of the of the external world of changing reality and so this then becomes the basis of a kind of a range of, of sort of fascist and right-wing anti-immigrant nationalist movements across the world. It becomes the basis of Trump's election in the United States and the build a wall kind of discourse, like keep people from the South out of the United States. It becomes the basis of Brexit and the, and the UK's decision to leave the European Union so that they can set up their own borders and prevent migration. And it's interesting, and this idea is even, you know, comes out in Australian government. The, um, the right-wing senator Fraser Anning um, actually expresses this very clearly in a statement. This is this statement, and this this is not like a statement from like the writings of Hitler or someone. This is a, a 2019 statement after the Christchurch massacre released by an Australian se senator saying, "We as a nation are entitled to insist that those who are allowed to come here predominantly reflect." the historic European Christian composition of Australia. It is time for us to decide whether we as a people will rise up against this, hold fast to the crimson thread of kinship that defines and unites us, and strive once more for the light on the hill, or concede the field to the enemies of Western civilization and see that all we, we were and all that we might have become uh, fall away into ruin. So here, you have, I mean, this is, a, this is a mainstream elected Australian politician essentially sprouting the kind of hats of, of racism. I mean, this is, the, this is directly kind of word for word, the kind of stuff that was, was being promoted by, by, by Hitler and other white supremacists. Um, and, and, but you see the ideas behind this, the idea that sort of Europeanness, whiteness, civilization, this kind of one thing, everything else is kind of bad, chaotic, destructive. Um, and this was a core idea that was used to justify colonialism, it was used to hide the fact that colonialism was violent by claiming that everyone else was violent and that colonialism was civilizing. It's a way of the West um, trying to to, to lie to itself about its own violence and to pretend that it's everyone else is the aggressor. And it's interesting because we'll see the same pattern happen in other situations. The aggressor themselves claims to be the victim and claims that their victims are the ones who are causing the violence. Um, but, and linked to this, this kind of weird um, construction of a sense of self, construction of a sense of of, 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 of sense, self linked to a historical privilege that may not be as stable as it used to be. So we start seeing this kind of the, 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 this, 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 this racist kind of hate speech, um, but it's not just simple kind of racist hate speech, it's paranoia. That, that is what we need to understand, that these ideas produce a kind of deranged state of paranoia that feels real like that this murderer, Fraser Anning, Hitler, I mean, in the sense that their paranoid state feels real to them. You know, the, the extremists who buy automatic assault rifles in the United States 
they, 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 their sense of being threatened in society feels real to them. The fact that it's not real is irrelevant. It feels real. They've, they've, they've through a system of ideas, created a sense of themselves and a sense of the world that feels very dangerous. That feels like it has to be that something radical has to happen to make themselves safe. And one of the ways that you can make yourself safe is by arming yourself. And another way to make yourself safe is by attacking people. Okay. So essentially what the Christchurch killer then does is he goes into where he knows there will be a community, a, a migrant community representing a, a culture that, that, that does not um, represent European whiteness. And he will literally kill them as part of what he sees as a legitimate act of war, as an act of defending his people against some kind of external threat. And so that's why the sort of white genocide, this like a white people are under attack when there's no sense in which they're under attack, um, is so powerful in creating um, these, the, these acts of terror. And that's why in the United States, one of the, 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 one of the primary motives behind these multiple kind of mass murders is this right-wing extremism, is it's a constant theme um, the Tree of Life Synagogue, um, Charleston Church, um, the, the kind of r r r white supremacist extremism is a, is, is, is a constant recurring theme in these, these terrorist acts. Um, but what's interesting about it is that they, it, it, it was, it's been an unrecognized theme for, for reasons. So let's look at some of the key issues. Let's just stop and close and reflect on this. Firstly, the Christchurch massacre relied on the fact that there were automatic weapons for sale, that citizens could get them. They couldn't, you couldn't get it in Australia, you could get it in New Zealand, so he killed people in New Zealand. Secondly, this huge problem of the, the, the role of the internet in spreading false information, that these systems of like fake news, these kind of worldviews, these snippets of paranoid information that create understandings, the way in which kind of YouTube algorithms or, you know, 4chan and 8chan kind of websites actually suck people into worldviews where they're constantly getting these reinforced messages that have nothing to do with reality. They're kind of pseudo real. They quote fake science. They quote um, incorrect st statistics. They, um, and, and they make people feel afraid. They make them feel like um, something terrible is, is happening that they need to protect themselves against. Um, and, and people lack the capacity to verify that stuff. And often the stuff is, it's made to look true. It's masquerading as journalism. They quote scientific papers where, where in fact, what they're saying got nothing to do with the scientific publication. Um, that these, 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 the, 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 this extent of paranoid false information is, is becoming a bigger and bigger social problem. The other thing, of course, that the security forces dropped the ball. I mean, this is exactly why there's a massive state budget, that there's huge legislation, there's a huge technological infrastructure of, of, of kind of surveillance, of monitoring, of infiltrating um, uh, extremist groups. And they, they ignored um, the fact that the, the, the most dangerous ideology was white supremacism uh, because they were so busy chasing after um, this idea of Islamic terrorism. They were so obsessed with the kind of Isla Islamophobic ideology that they put all their efforts into that and ignored the real threat under their noses. Um, and one of the reasons is because, of course, many of the security forces are actually sympathetic to, to, to those kinds of uh, extremism, um, that, they, that, that there are historical links in many countries between um, kind of white supremacism, policing, the military, um, and certainly in Australia, um, we see the, the, the kind of the, the, the person in charge of those security ser services, Peter Dutton, um, you know, as a, as a minister responsible for that, um, actively uh, um, supporting those extremist ideologies. This is a guy who publicly has um, sort of uh, repeated these white genocide mythologies. Um, quite openly in press interviews, he he he, he kind of regurgitating this uh, white this white genocide um, fake news, um, 
and um, and and that leads to the kind of failure to analyze the link between that kind of extremism um, and acts of violence, and to focus only on certain other kinds of extremism. The focus and 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 to introduce kind of security policies, um, border control policies, social policies that 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 act out of this kind of paranoid sense of threat, um, but are not informed by uh, an actual evaluation of what the risks are. Um, and so this is a really interesting lesson to us. Firstly, it's a lesson about the relation between ideas and violence. That the Christchurch killer killed because of ideas. Um, and he didn't make those ideas up. He didn't make up the ideas because he was psychotic. He learned those ideas. He learned them um, in the communities he lived in. He learned them on the internet. He read stuff. He was on in chat groups um, that were exposing him to this. Um, that those ideas are, were ideas that, however extreme and hateful and destructive they were, that were supported. They were supported by Fraser Anning and Peter Dutton. They were ministers and senators in Australian government. Um, they, they weren't kind of lunatic fringe ideas. They were crazy ideas, but they weren't fringe in that sense. And so the normalization of ideas, of ideas that are false, ideas that are paranoid, ideas that engender a sense of fear and combine that with a sense of hate, always end up leading to social destabilization and violence. And we need to think very deeply about this. And, 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 and one of the ways in which we need to think deeply about this is to, to think about whether our, 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 the way in which a whole criminal justice system of punishment, okay, yeah, the Christchurch killer is about to be sentenced as I, as I write this. Um, yeah, he'll go to jail for a long time. So what? That will not bring back the people he's killed, the people he's injured, the grieving families. Um, it will not stop the spread of the ideas that created him. It will not stop um, disaffected young men feeling like their futures are hopeless, getting sucked into um, kind of false and paranoid belief systems that fill them with, with hatred and rage. Um, and that requires an entirely different way of thinking about violence prevention, to understand how this young man, 28-year-old from New South Wales, became a, 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 a killer, rather than just focusing on, on con whether he did it. I mean, he's, a, he's, he's admitted his guilt, and he thinks he's going to become famous because of his guilt. Um, the question is, how did he come to believe such dangerous, ill-informed, lethal ideas that caused so much harm to so many people, and that he didn't make them up? He did not make up those ideas. Those ideas were made available to him. They were made available to him on the internet. They were made available to him in social networks. They were made available to him by leading public figures in Australian society. And that's what we need to think about in terms of understanding this violence.